They say it takes a village to raise a child because children need a lot of different people to look out for them. Families can use all the help they can get. After all, no parent is perfect. That's why McCoy leads the Early Intervention and Prevention Initiative. We want to showcase all of the excellent programs in our city that help families learn and grow together. Because when we learn and grow together, we make our village a better place to live. Thank you for tuning in. We hope you enjoy this episode of Our Kids, Our Families, Our Communities. Hi, you're watching Our Kids, Our Families, Our Communities. My name is Mitzi Wilson. I'm the Early Intervention and Prevention Initiative Director at the Marion County Commission on Youth. Today's topic to, will be focused on immigrant and refugee youth. And so I would like to introduce you to our guests that we have with us today, Rima Shahid, she's with the Muslim Alliance of Indiana, as well as Rachel Vantel with Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic. And so I would like to just kind of give you both a moment to introduce yourself and say a little bit about your role at your organization. So we can start with you, Rima. Hi, thank you for having me today. Um, my name is Rima, as you said, and I'm a native Hoosier. I was born here in Indianapolis. I lived here in Indiana before I got married and I moved to the Middle East, um, specifically Bahrain, where I worked at the Pakistan Embassy as a trained development officer. Fast forward 10 years and I'm happy to be back home and just honored to be the executive director at the Muslim Alliance of Indiana for just about two years now. Thank you. And Rachel? Yes, uh, Rachel Van Tyle. I work at the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, which is a civil legal aid organization here in Indianapolis. Um, I work as a senior immigration attorney there, supervising our um, immigrant justice program. Thank you. And I would like to just kind of give you both some time to share a little bit more about what your organization does. So Rima, beginning with you, can you say um, what is the work of the Muslim Alliance of Indiana? So the Muslim Alliance of Indiana is a statewide organization. Although we, we're small staffed, we do um, pride ourselves in being statewide and having presence in most of the major cities across Indiana. We are an umbrella organization um, in, Indian, in Indiana where we are more the policy and interfaith kind of arm of the Muslim community. So we pride ourselves in doing things like domestic violence workshops in which we have people understand cultural taboos. We, at any given point, we're testifying at the state house for hate crimes legislation, for example. We're speaking out against different policies. So that's more of the work that we do. Thank you. And Rachel? Um, yeah, like I mentioned, the uh, Neighbor Christian Legal Clinic is a civil legal aid organization. So we um, provide general civil legal aid to low-income Hoosiers. Um, we do immigration work. We work with victims of violent crime. We work with homeless youth, and among a variety of other things like taxes and expungement work as well. Thank you. And so um, I'm going to actually turn it back over to you, Rachel, sure. just before we kind of get dive, before we dive into our conversation today, um, to really make sure that we understand what we're talking about. Um, so can you really explain to us what is the difference between an immigrant and a refugee? Sure. Um, let me just start with the definition of a refugee. A refugee is a person who cannot return to their home country because they have a well-founded fear of persecution in their country. And that fear is based on their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or their social group. So they have to prove that to the State Department as well as the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees before entering the United States with the designation of refugee. An immigrant um, is a person who either intends to come for a short period of time or a long period of time. There's kind of two types of immigrants, but um, they usually come for a specific purpose. Um, and are, you know, go through background checks and things like that before coming into the United States. Thank you. Sure. And so how do your organization specifically serve immigrants or refugees? Yeah. Um, the Muslim Alliance of Indiana specifically, we work with last year on World Refugee Day, we had a immigrant and refugee clinic in which I know that different organizations such as Rachel's do a fantastic job of serving needs for our immigrant and 
refugee population here in the state, but there sometimes might be a few holes in that that we just wanted to fill. Not saying that there are, but in case there mm -hmm. were, just wanted to make sure that we fill those. So we had a fair in which we had, for example, the Marion County, the public school system mm -hmm. there to have them talk to different representatives from the public system to see how do you converse with, let's say, your refugee children there mm -hmm. that whose parents may not may or may not speak English, for example, or how do you obtain a license, things of that nature. We also try to provide them with that community sense that they may be missing. Mm -hmm. So to include them in Ramadan, for example, in our iftars. We also try to work with other organizations to fill different needs of housing. <clears throat> this morning I learned that there was a new family that was looking for a rug. So we do things like that, or we had a very generous donation in which one of our members donated entire furniture from entire apartment building to different refugee families. So that's more of the work that we do. Thank you, and that sounds very helpful. So really working around kind of you know culturally responsive yes. programming and helping educators within schools, um, you know, be able to culturally respond to the to the youth within the public school system, right. um, as well as providing kind of other supports for families that are here to feel a little bit more um, kind of welcomed and at home. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And Rachel. Um, yes. Yeah, so we serve immigrants in a variety of capacities. We do the legal work. Um, you know whether they need green cards or you know, legal permanent residence or citizenship or they want to bring family here. We do a lot of that work. We work with Exodus and Catholic Charities in doing that some of that work. But immigrants don't just necessarily have immigration issues, so we also attempt to serve, you know, maybe they have a tax issue, so our tax um, clinic will help the, with the tax issues, or maybe they have an, a criminal history that's preventing them from getting a good job. So we try to look at them more holistically and not just as an immigrant with an immigration problem. Thank you. And this is really kind of an important, you know, conversation for us to be having right now. Um, you know, we kind of sit in a climate when there's been um, really an administrative change that has really um, sparked a lot of confusion um, around immigrants and refugees in our country, mm -hmm. um, as well as, you know, just kind of the concern of people that um, live and work with immigrant and refugees, making sure that they um, help those communities feel supported, um, but also seeing incidents of kind of um, whether it's discrimination or hate that's happening. And so can you um, talk about how, you know, through your work you may have um, seen the impact of this current administration or some of the new rules that we're seeing um, impact the people that you serve? I think what's most, um, for, for me at the Neighbor Christian Legal Clinic, we've noticed just a lot of fear. Like even if things haven't actually happened, a lot of people have had a lot of fear about what might happen to them or their children or things like that. So in response to that, we've um, done probably six or seven what we call Know Your Rights presentations around the city and have created some you know, safety planning guides and things like this to help people feel a little bit more in control in this kind of un uncontrollable time, mm -hmm. frankly. So I think that although we haven't seen you know, people detained or things like that, um, we, I have seen a lot of fear and we're worried about people being um, taken advantage of in this time period. Thank you. I think I can mirror a lot of what Rachel has been saying. There's a lot of fear. There's a lot of misinformation. Um, we too have been having Know Your Rights clinics across the state. We have a lot of students, foreign students, at Earlham. Some of them are from the six countries that are now in the new executive order, and these students don't know whether they're going to be able to go home this mm -hmm. summer. I recently was speaking at a private high school here in our city, and one of the young ladies that I was speaking with, she, her dad is from one of those six countries, and she doesn't think her dad is going to be able to come and attend her high school graduation, which as a young adult, that, that must be so heartbreaking to not know. Besides that, I think that there's a great sense of defeat. I think people don't understand what these words are. They don't understand who is an immigrant, what do they look like. I know I've been told many times to go home, and home for me is just getting on 465 <laughs> and driving 20 <laughs> minutes north. Like I said, I was born here in Indiana. Mm -hmm. I know I was speaking at an event once, and somebody started screaming, gang rape and behead her. Mm. Oh, gosh. Because that's what they would do to you in your country. But this is my country. And so 
there is a great sense of division in our nation as well. I think that on wherever, whatever political views you align yourself with, both sides, there's a lot of misinformation and people just don't know what to do and they're relying on different news outlets to let them firm their own stance. And I would encourage people to actually understand what these policies mean and how they affect people. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate you, you know, sharing, you know, your personal experience, and that's kind of been, um, you know, some of this, some of the undertone of the dialogue around um, immigrant and refugee youth um, is just, you know, Islamophobia. And can you talk a little bit more about that? Islamophobia, we've seen a rise in Islamophobia in the past year and some change. There has been a 150% increase in Islamophobic acts across our nation and a 400% increase against acts against mosques. Mm -hmm. Here in Indiana, we had the Islamic Society of North America, which is the oldest umbrella organization, uh, Islamic umbrella organization here in Plainfield, Indiana, that had racial slurs um, written on it with spray paint, spray painted on it. We also had a mosque in Kokomo in which people stood outside with pig mosques, pig masks, and were screaming at people that just wanting to pray. Last week here in Evansville, there was a synagogue that was shot at. There was a man that went through, that ran inside of the Evansville mosque and was screaming at women cooking. And there was also an act of hate against church, a church in Evansville. and so. While Islamophobia is on the rise, there is also anti-Semitism, which, mm -hmm. which is on the rise. Other minority groups are feeling it, and we all kind of feel like we're under the fire mm -hmm. at the moment. And I, I thank you for kind of broadening, you know, the dialogue and um, about those that kind of feel um, in fear or definitely under concern right now. Um, and I, I know that your organizations kind of have been collaborating and working with other organizations, you know, to support um, and for solidarity. So can you speak a little bit about some of those efforts? Uh, sure. So I think one of the great things about being here in Indiana is that I do, I think Hoosier hospitality is a real thing and we really do care for the most part about each other. Um, my organization, the Neighbor Christian Legal Clinic, has been working with Immigrant Welcome Center to put on these Know Your Rights presentations. Um, but just generally, we, we collaborate very well um, among other organizations, Indiana Legal Services, um, Indianapolis Legal Aid Society, things like that, that will allow us to um, kind of collaborate and serve and not duplicate efforts. We all have so enough to do that we don't need to be doing things that everybody else is doing. So I think that communication there has allowed us to kind of make sure that we are standing in the gaps where there are gaps and making sure that we are um, serving clients across the state. Thank you. Um, yeah, I think that while we are, uh, it seems we are divided, but there's a great sense of a call to action, not only here in Indiana, but statewide. And we see more and more people getting involved and wanting to know how they can step up and maybe speak out against some of the things that they feel are wrong. Mm -hmm. And it's been great. We have formed so many more relationships and partners and community organizations that we work with daily. I know with the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic, we, with their help, we have these domestic violence workshops that we do across the mm -hmm. state. And it's kind of them to be able to drive with us you know, to South Bend mm -hmm. and to Crown Point and take time out of their day and their schedules and their missions to do that, just to stand in solidarity with the Muslim Alliance and to help us serve our own communities. Thank you. And could you share, I know, you know, it was a few weeks back but there's been this conversation or just kind of the, um, the campaign that we all belong here. Um, could you share about those efforts? I, um, I was very happy to be a part of We All Belong Here because I believe that we all do belong. This is something that speaks to my own heart. And so we had, back in January, I believe, we had a, when the first executive orders were about to be signed, I believe it was January, we had a press conference regarding that. And then after we thought, you know, besides press conferences, we need people need to know how they can get involved. Mm -hmm. And so just a couple weeks ago, we had a week of action okay. in which different organizations that were a part of We All Belong had, so to say, marching orders mm -hmm. for the day. Whether that was going to a mosque 
and attending private Friday prayers and getting to know more about Islam or having a movie screening which was Welcome to Shelbyville which was about Shelbyville, Indiana. Mm -hmm. Going and meeting your local legislators locally and in DC. It was a great week in which different people were able to go and get involved in whatever they thought was best. Thank you. And kind of one conversation that I, you know, want to make sure that we highlight is just really the conversation around undocumented youth. Um, Rachel, can you talk about, you know, who is or um, kind of what is an undocumented youth, um, the designation or the term? Yes. So this is w one of my high horses that I get yeah. on. Um, <laughs> but I think it's so, so important to change the rhetoric of the, mm -hmm. about the way we're speaking about people. Um, so if you say the word illegal, which kind of makes me cringe a little bit, yeah. Um, I will probably stop you and say you should let's not use that word. And, exp and more than that, we have to explain why it's not okay, right? Mm -hmm. Actions can be illegal. You can do an illegal act, but people in and of themselves are not illegal. Um, people are are people, and regardless mm -hmm. of where they come from, we should they should be treated with dignity and respect. Mm -hmm. And so I prefer to use the term undocumented. What's difficult is that sometimes immigrants themselves will refer to themselves as illegal, but I just keep calling them undocumented. Okay. <laughs> They'll go, oh no, I'm illegal. I'm, okay, well, you're undocumented. So I just, even with, <laughs> among the immigrant community, changing mm -hmm. the way they speak about themselves because they can kind of be negative towards themselves. Interesting. Yeah. And, um, you know, and I, I think that oftentimes people um, have kind of a certain characterization of, you know, who was undocumented. Right. So um, can you share a little bit to help people understand, um, you know, how a person would become, we would say, undocumented? Yeah, sure. So there's kind of a few ways. One would be um, if you cross the border without permission, um, that would be, you know, a person who then remained in the United States would be undocumented. Um, but most commonly, it's a person who entered with some sort of permission, a visa to stay temporarily, and then stay overstays that visa. And so that's really why you can't just tell by looking at somebody if they're undocumented or not, right? Mm -hmm. um, I know plenty of Africans that are undocumented. The, when DACA first came out, they said there were something like a million um, Asian Americans that were eligible for DACA that didn't, didn't, you know, didn't end up applying. But mm -hmm. I think there's a greater stigma in some cultures than others. But you know, certainly our, our Hispanic immigrants, some of them are undocumented, many of them are not. You know, many of them are here lawfully. So um, it doesn't, you can't just look at somebody and know like, oh, they're undocumented. Mm -hmm. um, so I think that, you know, we have to think about the broader sense about how somebody becomes undocumented. Did they cross? Yes. But you also have to think about, I always think, of, you have to think about the motivation about why somebody mm -hmm. crosses that. It takes a lot to want to uproot your country and move them, uproot, uproot your family and move them to another country mm -hmm. um, and so we have to I think we have to give them a little bit of grace there where we say you know maybe they came here but you probably don't know the whole story thank you yeah and you um, you mentioned an, another word DACA um, oh, deferred, yes. or, mm -hmm. deferred deferred action, action for, for childhood, childhood arrivals yep. can you um, talk a little bit more about that I believe the dreamers are the yeah individuals. so this would be what the program for what we call dreamers and um, it was signed June 15th 2012 by President Obama I mean, basically gives a, a reprieve to these children who were brought here um, without any authority on their own. So they had to have been brought here before they were 16. They have to be um, in cor currently enrolled in school or graduated from school or things like that. N you know, no criminal history. Basically, kids have grown up here their whole lives thinking that they're Americans, and maybe they just found out that they weren't born here. Um, and so it. it is a program which allows um, immigration to say, okay, we're not going to deport you. You're going to have a work permit for the next two years, um, and then allows them to kind of come out of the shadows a little bit. We were anticipating that this program would be canceled, but the more and more we hear, it sounds like maybe it's, um, there's enough pushback that it's going to stay in place, which is a really great thing. Thank yeah. You. I know we've kind of, you know, unpacked a lot of, you know, information, um, but for someone that's watching and, and wants to get involved, um, how might they um, get involved or connected with your organizations, Rima? Um, you can always visit. We have a very big Facebook and social media presence, so you can visit that and message us. You can go on to www.indianamuslims.org, and there is a section where you can message us and want to volunteer, get involved. You can also ask to be included on our listserv so you can know about 
things like we belong and when the next event is or when the next mosque open house is so you can get to know your Muslim who's your neighbor things of that nature so I think that would be a, a great start thank you and Rachel so um, the Neighborhood Christian Legal Clinic we have a website it's www.nclegalclinic.org um, there you'll find opportunities to volunteer and donate um, but just know we're not just looking for attorneys, right? There's lots of things that non-attorneys can do um, to help, you know, our immigrant neighbors or other low-income neighbors who need assistance. Um, everything from helping st somebody study for a naturalization mm -hmm. test um, to maybe, you know, just befriending somebody who isn't, who isn't, have a, doesn't have a lot of family here and doesn't feel very connected. So we're always looking for all kinds of volunteers. Thank you. Sure. And, and really in terms of, you know, supporting the immigrant and refugee youth in our community, what are um, just some everyday things that people can do um, to make sure that they are being supportive or to show their support? Um, I think for, for my organization specifically, <coughs> <coughs> sorry, I often say that Muslims represent about 3.3% of Indiana's population and close to one, a little over 1% of the nation's population. And there's a big stigma that Muslims have recently arrived or there's so many Muslims coming over and taking over our nation, and that simply isn't the case. The first mosque that we know of that was documented here in Indiana was established in 1920. And so Muslims have been here, you know, one of our founding fathers actually had a Quran. Muslims have been here since the inception of this nation. We are not a new phenomenon, and but the fact is, is that we do represent such a small minority of our country's population. Is the fact is that most people don't know a Muslim, mm -hmm. and I would encourage people to actually understand what Islam really is, what Muslim Americans really look like, and how our values are all the same, how we are truly all the same. And I think a lot of what's happening around our country, around our state, is due in fact driven by fear. We always fear the unknown. And once you actually get to know Muslims across our state and across our country, you will simply know that that's not the case. The stereotypes are falsely placed. And that would help the immigrant populations, the Muslim immigrant populations, the refugee populations, and go up and talk to someone get to know them because we've become such a small marginalized group that's on the fringes that we almost work like the kid that nobody wants to talk to and so when anybody comes and talks to us we're like yay we found a friend <laughs> make a friend and get to know your Muslim neighbor yeah thank you I mean I think you can even extend that beyond Muslims and say you know what get to know an immigrant you until you get to know them you maybe you won't understand their story but mm -hmm. Um, I think just getting to interact with people just generally. And I would really encourage immigrants to help change the rhetoric about the way we speak about people. Um, again, like with the undocumented versus illegal thing. And, you know, stopping, if you hear somebody using that word, you know, say, you know, that's not an appropriate word to use. I mean, it's like you can, you can attribute it to other slurs almost, that it's just not an appropriate way to describe a person. And so I think if, you know, if that, uh, when I have interns at my office, if that's the one thing I leave them with is that they go and tell their friends not to use that word, I think it's, it's a good thing, right? So change the rhetoric. Thank you. Yeah. And I did want to, you know, offer you both some time if there are some upcoming events um, that you would like to share with our audience um, to let us know about those things. So is there anything upcoming that you'd like to share with us? Yes. Yeah, so this evening I'll be speaking at IUPUI regarding um, women's role in Islam and what a Muslim woman really looks like. Tomorrow we have another staff member that's gonna be speaking about that. And there's a lot of mosque open houses that are gonna be taking place within the next few months. So I would encourage you again to visit our website and to see the next upcoming mosque open house and to visit a mosque and see how it's no different than any other place of worship. Thank you. Um, yes, so we, uh, the Immigrant Justice Program will be hosting a refugee adjustment day, which is to help uh, recently arrived, you know, within the last year, refugees um, apply for their citizen or their green cards. So, if you're interested in volunteering for that, you can go to our website and find in more information about that. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to be a great event. Okay, thank you, and that's a great segue. If you could um, help people direct or direct people to your website, how would they reach you? Yes. So our website is www.nclegalclinic.org. Okay. And, and then, ours is www.indianamuslims with an S dot org.
Thank you. Well, that um, will wrap up our um, show topic for today. So I definitely want to thank our guest, Rachel and Rima. I really pre appreciate the information that you've shared with us. I know that we've really only kind of gotten to the, you know, to the tip of the iceberg, we might say. Um, and so because of that, um, we will have um, at McCoy, the Marion County Commission on Youth, um, additional follow-up events. So you can um, look to our um, website or our Facebook page for more information and detail about that. Um, but I just thank you for watching our kids, our families, and our communities. Thank you.